Well, you guys want to go ahead and get started in the meantime? Here's another one trickled in just then. Because we've got some interesting cases here that kind of have a little bit of a theme this morning I thought you guys might be interested in. Yeah, I was wondering about your theme. <laughs> um, you'll read my mind approach, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so for this one, we have like kind of a well, um, kind of well circumscribed nodule. I mean, we won't get the entire base, but I think it's well circumscribed nodule. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, this to me is like a well, um, sort of fall, like hanging off the epidermis of these like um, kind of uh, like somewhat basaloid cells at the periphery with like kind of more clearer cells in the middle. Yeah, good. So um, you could call this uh, an acanthotic epidermis with these yeah. aggregations of the cells that are somewhat basaloid at the periphery and clear in the center that are contiguous with those areas. It's obviously very symmetrical and like you said, small. And I think this is the base of it, like you mentioned. So, and it's an, it's an obviously a benign. Mm -hmm. and uh, epithelial. I think we can agree on that. So what kind of differentiation do you think this is exhibiting? Um, I thought that this was going to be like pilar differentiation. Um, like and when you say pilar. Or it's, it's like matric, you know, matrical kind of. Um, well, so let's think about the follicle itself. Yeah. So you've got four components. Of the we, used, we used to say three. But you've got the infundibulum, the upper part, which basically is lined by stratified squamous epithelium and has a basket with cornified layer in it. And then you've got, got the isthmus, which is between the infundibulum and then the lower part of the follicle, really the inferior portion. Mm -hmm. And then actually at that isthmus level lives the mantle zone. You know, so we it's kind of important just to remember that. You don't really see much there routinely, but a lot of interesting things happen at that mantle zone area. And so when you think about the inferior portion of the follicle, you do have the matrical epithelium at the, at the base of that, where the hair bulb is located that has a, a papilla and a rich blood supply and you got those very basaloid matrical cells. But then you've got the structure between the isthmus and, the, and that bulbar area where you've got the layers of the hair follicle. And so you've yeah. got like the inner root sheath, outer root sheath, um, cuticle of the inner root sheath and the outer root sheath, that sort of thing. So that is probably what we're looking at here as a yeah. matrix, which would be those little, when you see like a palometric oval, for example, if you see the, the cells, the basaloid cells there, they're really very blue and small and they're proliferative and that sort of thing. So here you've got, you've got some, something here, as you said before, was clear staining. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what part of the follicle gives you a clear staining cytoplasm of many of the cells um i'm thinking like the outer root sheath yeah good so this is the outer root sheath of the follicle that this is uh exhibiting and there's a name for that that people use so hair uh trike and limel kind of means lining if you will so trike limel differentiation so this is the outer root sheath of the follicle so it's a benign neoplasm with trichelimal differentiation. So what's the diagnosis? <laughs> um, I mean, I thought it was like a, a trichelimoma, um, right? <laughs> yeah, trichelimoma, exactly. Or you say trichelimoma, whatever you want to say. But yeah, so this is a trichelimoma. Um, some people also refer to this as a trichelimal veruca because a lot of times it kind of looks sort of like a wart. So that's sort of a synonym of it, if you will. Uh, so you can look over here. It's kind of got more of a squamous epithelial component. And notice that you've got these um, little whorls, these squamous eddies here. Um, that's what you see in a, in a so-called inverted follicular keratosis. So this is a benign and axial neoplasm. It's in this case, has sort of two different lines of differentiation. One that's kind of going more towards the probably infundibulum of the follicle with the squamous eddies here. And then the other, which has got the nice trichelimal differentiation. It's important uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is you don't want to misdiagnose this as a basal cell. Yeah. You see that a lot of times. Uh, somebody takes a shave, biopsy of one of these, and then it gets overcalled as a basal cell, and then it gets excised, and it doesn't need to be excised. But So that's probably a relatively minor uh, error, but it, it is a, an error. It's a problem when it happens. Over You get over surgery. 
But then there's one other element that's important about this that you need to know for the board examination. What if somebody had cadence. multiple of these? Yeah, you want to worry about cadence or think about cadence. Good. You want to think about Cowden syndrome. I couldn't tell who that voice in the world was, was there was <laughs> talking. It was Kishin. Good. Uh, tell us a, a touch about Cowden's syndrome. What uh, what do you have to worry about in Cowden's syndrome? They get uh, nasty tumors like breast tumor, aggressive thyroid tumors. Um, they can get GI malignancies. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you want to work them up. Cancers. Them Good. Are there any other lesions that you see in Cowden's other than trichelimal lesions on the skin? You can get like oral cobblestoning or oral fibromas, I think. Um, but there's probably other adnexal neoplasms they get too. Yeah, I think the one that uh, Ron Rapini described years ago is a sclerotic fibroma that can be associated with Cowden syndrome. So uh, just I would bone up on that. The, the boards love to ask about syndrome. So uh, you're very likely to encounter that and make sure you know what some of the neoplasms are that are associated with it. Okay, very good. Good job. Let's move on to the next one. A little different pattern here. This one kind of departs from the theme a little bit, but. Um, I can keep going. If, uh... No, I can, I can go. Don't worry. Um, I don't want you to have to go twice. This is a punch. Um, Good. And I would say on scanning, it kind of looks like a little bit square almost. Um, yeah, just I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Now, when you say and square, uh -huh. what, what does that make you think about when you say square at low magnification? I think there's a couple of different like diagnoses that you can think about. You can think about like morphia. You can think about something depositional like scleromyxedema or um, sclerodema. So, um, so basically, that's sort of jumping to a diagnosis, which is good to do that. That's okay. But why is it square? What's the reason that it's square? There's something like sclerotic or yeah, the, the dermis is 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 uh, hard, if you will. So something right. is making it where it doesn't normally, normally you take a punch biopsy in the clinic, somebody's got maybe, you know, uh, you're biopsying something to rule out MF or something like that, and they don't really have any thick skin. And it, you notice how it kind of instantly sort of contracts and it's it's the elastic fiber that just kind of pulls it in. And so the, the top up here is bigger than down here. It kind of almost sort of uh, has a, it, it's got a curvature inside it, if you will. Well, here it's not doing that because the dermis is, is thickened. It's, it's hard for some reason or other. And one reason is it can be a deposit, like you said. Uh, that's definitely one reason. Uh, it can also be sclerotic. The collagen can be thickened. Um, what's another reason that it can possibly be very firm and, and feel woody and thick like that other than, than those reasons? Um, I guess just a, like edema or I'm not sure. Edema could do it. Yeah. Uh, so think about you. You're right on the right track when you say deposit. Something so just, infiltrated. Yeah, there you go. Something that kind of comes in here and it doesn't belong there. Like, for example, metastasis of breast cancer. Um, if you've ever seen a, a patient that's got recurrent breast cancer at the site where they've had the surgery and you feel that lesion that it comes back, it feels extremely hard, rock hard. And when you biopsy it, that skin does the same thing like morphine. It forms a square block like this. So yeah, you're, you're so just whenever it looks square at low magnification, you say, wow, it's either sclerotic collagen or maybe there's a deposit, you know, maybe they just have thick skin in some cases, but then always look for some kind of a neoplasm here. So, so what about in this case? Did you see anything that didn't belong in the dermis here? Yeah. I mean, you know, I know with this, I mean, there's a lot of thickened collagen bundles in here for sure. Um, those like kind of pink wavy thick strands, but then there's also these interstitial um, sort of bluish looking cells. And I think, good. you know, Excellent. some of them do look like they are uh, in that sort of Indian single file row in some areas. Um, so you could think about the metastatic breast cancer. Um, 
I think in the differential for those, I don't know, I'm not seeing a ton of mucin is like interstitial GA. I think sort of at the top area, there's almost like an interface process that's happening. And I don't know if that's just my eyes seeing it like up there, yeah. No, there's something um, going on up here too. And, and if you look carefully in this area, you can see that- I mean, Some of those be... cells look pleomorphic and, and, and not normal. For Good, sure. excellent, absolutely correct. And then uh, let's keep scrolling around. We might be able to see some other areas that kind of give some more kind of clues. Here's another area over here where you've got these epithelioid cells here and they're yeah. forming these little kind of spaces between them a little bit here. Yeah, yeah. And then here's another area over here where you've got these little yeah. irregular areas. Does that give you any clues that yeah, I'd be more worried? I'd be more worried about a, a metastatic process or a, an infiltrative uh, cancer of some sort. Yeah. Like so this is cancer, cancer for sure. You're exactly right. Um, I don't know that the board would just throw something like this at you and expect you to get it right away. So the main thing I wanted to point out is, is exactly what you said. It's an interstitial mostly process, which suggests that it may be something coming from secondary to the area. There's one other uh, thing that can do this. These are all blood vessels here. These are irregular, bizarre blood vessels with this large endothelial cell protruding in a lumen here. And then you see these very atypical cells out here. This is an example of an angiosarcoma that's basically just kind of dissecting diffusely throughout the dermis, giving you this interstitial mostly pattern. So uh, I don't, you wouldn't necessarily be expected to pick up on this on something like that on an exam, but I, I think just mainly just understanding that when something is interstitial like this, it can cause this, the thickness of the skin. And think about what you said, metastatic neoplasms and things like leukemia, lymphoma, sometimes in those spread to the skin secondarily, they can give you kind of an interstitial mostly pattern. And then vascular lesions, they, they go into that category also. Capuchy sarcoma, the patch and plaque stage is an interstitial mostly uh, neoplasm. And then this entity too, uh, angiosarcoma can be an interstitial mostly process. So this biopsy, thank goodness, was, was pretty good biopsy for that. Um, angiosarcoma can be deceptively difficult to diagnose. And if you just get a superficial shave biopsy or something like this, I mean, you would be hard pressed to make the diagnosis. You might not even recognize it as a, as a malignancy if you just barely got into it. So if you're ever dealt with an angiosarcoma, um, you're almost mandated to take a fairly large biopsy that needs to go deep and uh, often, if we're going to make that diagnosis, we will recommend that the clinician take an incisional biopsy or certainly correlate it with the, the clinical photograph or something like that. And obviously, if you weren't sure of, of what this was, you'd stain it, work it up, you know, do maybe a CD31 or something like that. So the, I think the lesson here is this interstitial, mostly kind of neoplastic process here. So good. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Look at this bottom one here. All right, I'll go. Um, all right, so we have a shave biopsy of a kind of small papule, looks like. Yeah. Um, we sort of have like the, like a little bit of um, acanthosis of the epidermis um, kind of sort of hugging around um, something yeah. in the dermis. Yeah, kind of almost forming a little collarette, if you will. I, I think that's a good observation there. Whenever you uh -huh. see that, it's just, it's almost always benign. Right. Occasionally you can get metastases like metastatic melanoma, something like that. But the vast majority of the time, it's when you get this, it's a slowly growing thing and the epidermis is just kind of growing around it. So. Yeah. Um, And so, I mean, it's like at this power um you know relatively like cellular but also i think we're like it's not looking super pink it's still looking like kind of clearish like yeah maybe. good actually good so it's also a clear <laughs> staining lesion so therein lies the theme of today's yeah. session um anything else that you see here so we've got clear cells here and then yeah. you've got um these kind of like, things yes yeah, so like I guess it's kind of clefting. 
And some of those are clefts, but I think some of them actually are blood vessels also. Okay. Okay. So that was lying. He's barely seeing. Yeah. 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 So, so. And yeah, some of the other sections were more obvious to me with the vasculature. Yeah. And this is easier to see at this power for me. Um, you think it's more of a neoplasm and more of a uh, inflammatory process? I thought it was more neoplastic. It's Good. Like a benign neoplasm. Like I was Good. thinking it'd be like a fibrous papule with like clear cell change. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly what this is. So the the there are like a number of different variants of fibrous papules. You can get cellular fibrous papules. They just have a lot of uh, really large kind of uh, fibroblasts. You can get pleomorphic angiofibroma, where you get the large pleomorphic cells, those kind of floret cells that you can kind of see in a pleomorphic fibromas and pleomorphic lipomas, things of that nature. Um, you can get a this variant, which is a clear cell angiofibroma, clear cell fibrous papule. Um, again, this is probably glycogen here. Um, now, what are some other ways that cells can become clear? So we have glycogen is one. What are some other things that make cells look clear? Um, like foam cells can look yeah. clear. Foam cells, which would be lipid. Like say somebody's got maybe a xanthoma. Um, I'm trying to think what else. You know, sebaceous cells can be clear. Yeah. Um, you can get uh, sort of clear white looking cells and say like a balloon cell nevus, for example. Uh, you know, so there's there's a kind of a, a number of different entities that give you clear staining uh, change in cells. They can be lipid. They can be, you know, probably organelles like you know, I'm not sure what the actual uh, substance is inside the cell of a, of a pagetoid cell or a balloon cell of a, of a nevus, probably mitochondria and other things like that. Uh, obviously, lipid is important. You know, you see fat or anything like that. And sometimes it's it's other material. But but those are the main things that really give you kind of clear staining features. And this is probably going to be glycogen here. If you wanted to stain this this to sort of prove that it was glycogen, what stain would you use? Is it PAS? Yeah, PAS stain. And if you wanted to prove, say, that it was lipid, what stain might you use? You can use, I don't know what the most common one is, but um, like oil red, Sudan black. Yeah, uh, oil red O is, is one that's used. That has to be done on fresh tissue. There's another one called a dipophilin that is used. Um, and that's like if we're like looking at say something we think might be a sebaceous lesion, we often will stain it with that to see if the if there's any sebaceous cells that mixed with the basaloid cells. So that's the one that you really kind of use for lipid. Um, but anyway, that's this is a nice example of a clear cell fibrous papule, clear cell angiofibroma, relatively rare, uh, but uh, we do see it on occasions. So that's good that you knew that. So uh, now, what uh, diseases do we have to be worried about when we're dealing with uh, angiofibromas? Like tuber sclerosis. Yeah, tuber sclerosis. So that's the obvious one there. I, I don't know that um, there's been any relationship between clear cell change in this and any other syndrome. Um, what about a clear cell syringoma? Has that been associated with any condition that you guys are aware of? Mostly it's associated with diabetes. Uh, I'm not sure that that's really true or not, but it's been reported in the literature. Uh, you know, and, I, and I, I've seen lots of biopsies of patients with tuberous sclerosis over the years. I've never seen one that had a clear cell change in it. So maybe if you biopsy a gazillion of them, one would show up, but uh, they usually are just regular garden variety angiofibromas. Okay, how about this one? And take this case, Dr. Cockrell. Here we have a, <clears throat> I guess this was maybe like an excision of some sort, excisional biopsy, and there's this very large sub-Q nodule or well, it might be a, it might nodule. Be a, it might be a shave. You know, in other words, you could, could you picture this thing being maybe kind of mm, a, a like dunculated a lesion? Yeah, yeah, and they just kind of went in and said, let's just whack this thing off here, which was nice of them to do. So it's a good biopsy. They got almost to the bottom of it. Um, yes. So I think just on scanning, like the epidermis looks pretty unchanged, except for maybe some flattening of the reedy, like across the most, um, exophytic part of this lesion. Yeah, good. 
any particular reason why that might be happening? Um, I'm not sure, but I know like whenever, like in a DF or whatever, whenever you have something underneath chronically, sometimes it flattens out. Yeah, there's a couple of different reasons. You know, it can be just, you know, somebody getting older and their skin gradually just loses the, the reedy. That's one way. Another way is if maybe there's something that's beneath it that's pressing upward on it, possibly, maybe compromising the blood flow a little bit and, and then not nourishing the epidermis quite as well. It's kind of interesting because over here, there's plenty of epidermal reedy uh, on both sides of that. And then this area where it looks like it's kind of almost like it is pressing upwards, mm -hmm. um, you lose the reedy here. It's kind of an interesting observation. So that might be a clue. Um, so do you think this is an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? I think this is neoplastic. Good. And uh, do you think it's benign or malignant? So if I look at the individual cells, I um, don't think that they're particularly atypical looking, but the overall look of it, I would think uh, malignant. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because when you when you look at it at low power, say, well, you know, it's pretty symmetrical. It's round, you know, it's yeah. not giant. It's maybe eight millimeters or less or something like that. So it's not a gargantuan. So you might say, well, it kind of looks like it could be benign on architectural features, maybe a little bit asymmetrical over here. But uh, there's a sort of an exception to the rule of low grade, low magnification architectural benignity that sometimes it's not benign. Okay, so you think it's a, uh, a neoplasm. Did you think it was epithelial or non-epithelial? Um, I, I guess they look epithelioid. Okay, they're kind of square and... I wouldn't royal. necessarily think that they're epithelial, though. Okay, okay, good. I'll, I'll be, I'll just, <laughs> I just saw a lot of hemorrhage. So the first thing I thought of with these, like, clear staining cells and hemorrhage is renal cell. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is, it, is it only hemorrhage? Now, this is hemorrhage, but is it only hemorrhage that you're seeing? Are those vessels? There's actually some blood vessels, too, here that are filled with erythrocytes. So it's a very vascular lesion, which is mm -hmm. characteristic of this, of this entity. Um, so, yeah. So when you think of a clear cell lesion with a lot of blood vessels, um, it looks, it's got these, not just clear cells, look at the organization of the cells. They're actually forming little structures here that are recapitulating the nephron of the kidney. So these are, you know, almost like tubules. The kidney is what's really kind of going on here. So it's actually recapitulating uh, the neoplasm that's actually in the kidney itself here. And one other thing about renal cell carcinoma that's interesting is that sometimes the cells themselves are not super atypical. Uh, notice that there's really not a lot of mitotic figures in here. Mm -hmm. So if you just looked at it at high magnification, say, well, those cells don't really look super, uh, you know, pleomorphic or atypical. And it's actually one of the cancers that if you get it, uh, it's not nearly as bad when it metastasizes, say, as like pancreatic cancer or liver cancer or something like that, which has a very short uh, lifetime after you get something like that. Once, you know, pancreatic cancer goes bad, you're dead in a short period of time. This lesion, people live for years. Uh, with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. You know, there's maybe a mitotic figure right here, but it just shows you that uh, not every single metastasis of cancer is necessarily a death sentence. So this is another clear cell lesion. So we've had clear cell from the trichelimal cells of the hair follicle. We've had clear cells of the fibroblasts of presumably their fibroblast, the clear cell angiofibroma. And then now we have a clear cell metastatic carcinoma, a metastatic renal cell uh, malignancy. So this is a good example of that. Um, you know, this, it, this is another one that you really want to make sure you take a good biopsy of. I mean, I've seen the superficial shaves of these kind of things, and you just can't really call it on something like this. So you really need to get down to the heart of the lesion and, and get something that you know, we can take a look at. So this is an, and notice that when lesions metastasize to the skin, they can look pseudo benign at low magnification. You know, they can be, they can look relatively symmetrical. They can look pretty small. So just whenever something looks benign, it sort of looks like a dermal nodule say, well, let me back up. Let's make sure it's not a metastasis of something. So good. No problems on that one, right? 
Okay, I can help with this one. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Am I echoing now? Or am I okay? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it better now? Um. Yeah. I'm not. Okay. Sorry, I was logged into devices. Um. Okay. So this looks like um. There's a proliferation of sort of basaloid cells in the dermis um, that's pretty well circumscribed. Um, there's, there looks to be like two different populations of cells. Like on the left, there's kind of like a darker, um, you know, a darker blue color. And then it also, you know, more like clear cell change on the right. Good. Um, and so it kind of, you know, I'm looking just like from higher power on the left, like it, it's almost more like these kind of like fronds or these sort of like, like almost kind of mimicking like, you know, basal cell carcinoma, but I don't think this is a basal cell. Um, and there's sort of like in between the cells, there's like this um, eosinophilic stroma. Um, on the right, it's almost like, you know, we kind of have this like clear cell change again with, um, it almost looks sort of like mucinous or something, but again, it looks like that it's probably all part of the same thing, but just kind of like two different cell populations. Yeah, you've got the these clear cells. They kind of look pretty much sort of like that trichalimal lesion that we had before. Um, and then let's look at the other side over here. So it does have a follicular component, mm -hmm. but there there is a type of basal cell carcinoma that can kind of give you sort of an infundibulocystic morphology like mm -hmm. this, and so even though it looks pretty follicular, um, this is probably not a lesion that you'd necessarily want to leave it's in right there off. forever, you know? Yeah. So we, we thought this was most likely another variant of a basal cell, like a clear cell basal cell carcinoma with follicular differentiation. But the key thing here is also like in basal cell carcinoma, you can get clear cell change like this. So a lot of people, some people might argue and say, well, it's really not a classic basal cell. And I agree, it's not. Um, it does have some follicular differentiation. But this is in the in the family of the follicular basaloid neoplasms. And, you know, and they sort of develop this kind of morphology up in here. And, you know, it looks like we get a little peripheral palisade and a pretty solid, maybe some mitotic figures in here. Then we sometimes just default to say, well, let's just call it probably a variant of a basal cell carcinoma. So a lot of things get call basal cell that um, aren't just perfect classic nodular superficial basal cell carcinomas, but there is a clear cell variant of basal cell carcinoma that this is fairly good example of. I mean, this is the, the type of clear cell change that you can get in the so-called clear cell basal cell carcinoma. And it kind of makes sense because if, you know, basal cell carcinoma is a follicular neoplasm, um, it kind of in the, the classic, you know, carcinoma with the sonic hedgehog pathway mutations, patch gene mutation. Well, that goes more to kind of the classic peripheral palisading, the nodular forms and everything else. But if you get these other variants, they're coming off of the same area. And sometimes they have more follicular differentiation or clear cell differentiation like, like here. So this is just another example of a clear cell neoplasm that you can develop in lesions that you don't normally think of clear cells, like the angiofibroma, for example. I'm Dr. Cockrell. Uh, I mean, that's really helpful. I didn't know there was like a clear cell variant. Um, I, I was wondering, like, how do you know that this is like, what leads you to get on the, you know, for like basal cell car? Is it just like how large it is or like infiltrative or is it for like, cause I was kind of looking at like the stroma of the other cells. Yeah, it's, it's, it was it's, more follicular, but I agree. It's, know. it's definitely in the follicular category. I think if we just see this little lesion here on its own over mm -hmm. here, this looks a lot like a so-called keratotic basal cell. And so rather than calling it sort of two different entities and giving it a, a funny name or whatever, uh, I think a lot of people just would sort of default this and say, well, it's it's consistent with a clear cell basal cell carcinoma, make sure it's completely excised, something like this. But if you only had a biopsy of this alone, um, there's a variant of basal carcinoma that's a keratotic basal cell. And it looks like this. You get these little sort of, uh, it's not really a trichoepithelioma, but it's kind of a primitive uh, basaloid, almost not really papillomer zinkable bodies, but they're little primitive basaloid aggregations. And you see people that have nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, they often have basal cell lesions that look very much like this adjacent to their more obvious nodular basal cells or superficial basal cells. And so this is just one subset, one type of basal cell. And there are 
probably about oh, 15 or 20 that have been described in the in the literature. So it is a follicular lesion. Um, if you left this alone, would it behave like a classic basal cell and become ulcerative and nodular? I don't really know. Uh, but this, this is what these lesions often get called, keratotic basal cell. Then there's this clear cell component, then maybe some people would call this a clear cell basal cell carcinoma. So the answer is it's kind of somewhat uh, subjective and somewhat controversial. But just realize that there is a clear cell variant of basal carcinoma, and this is this would be kind of what some people would refer to that as. Okay. Now we have another lesion. All right. This is a, a sort of like verrucous lesion. There's a lot of, uh, I don't know if that's stratum corneum or if it's all, if this is, yeah, this this is stratum corneum up here. Uh, pretty thick. Maybe it's acral. Very thick. I don't, it could be acral, yeah. Or close to the acral. It may just close be problematically. Yeah. Um, there's some pretty clear cells in there again. <laughs> um, at least I think so in some areas. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing is kind of clear here, yeah. isn't it? The cells look uh, relatively... Well, most of them look at normal. There may be some larger ones in there. Um, but it's pretty oh, diffusely never. acanthotic. It's very acanthotic. And, and here you've got some very pleomorphic cells. Yeah. Uh, you've got close crowding of nuclei up here. Uh, you probably find some mitotic figures in here in a couple of areas. Very Did you consider this pagetoid? Not really pagetoid itself, that's usually where you get um, individual cells that kind of have a clear staining cytoplasm, sort of like someone fired a shotgun into a so-called buckshot scatter. This is really confluent uh, keratinocytic atypia going throughout the epithelium here. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you could think about, I mean, there's variants of Bowen's disease that are clear cell. That could be a possibility. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what this is. This is squamous cell carcinoma in situ with yet another example of clear staining morphology. So again, you don't normally think about squamous cells giving clear cell morphology, but they can too. And uh, this is a nice example of that here. And once again, this is probably glycogen if you were to stain this. Um, I don't know where this came from, like the last one, we could probably say was maybe recapitulating tricholimal uh, areas of the skin. This one is, is probably just garden variety, just atypical keratinocytes that have acquired this clear staining uh, characteristic. So I don't know why that happens, but it's just another example of where you can get a clear cell morphology uh, in a cancer. So we've got renal cell carcinoma, we've got a basal cell carcinoma, we've got this cancer, so just, and, and even the angiosarcoma sometimes, those can even be clear cell, believe it or not. So just uh, another example of that. So you guys can appreciate this is very atypical. It's markedly acanthotic, very atypical cells here. Um, you know, it's like a multinucleated cell there and hyperchromatic nuclei. So you would, hopefully you would recognize that this is cancer. And then the acanthotic cornified layer, just like the hyperkeratosis over solar keratosis, you often get so-called malignant dyskeratosis overlying squamous cell carcinoma also. Okay. You guys getting sick and tired of clear staining things yet? <laughs> I can do this one. Um, so shave biopsy, um, we kind of have a like clear cell um, <clears throat> epidermal process that really like has a sharp beginning and end. Yeah, good, excellent. Um, and uh, it's acanthotic, um, like a clear cell acanthoma. Yeah, good, that's exactly what this is. It's not a bad name. Because uh, once again, it, it 
does, you know, acanthoma is just another name for benign tumor, if you will. Um, so basically, it's very sharply circumscribed, as you noted, normal epithelium, and then suddenly you get this acanthotic epithelium with these very clear staining cells. And this is uh, probably here recapitulating the outer root sheath of the hair follicle once again here. So this probably came from the mantle zone, I would, would say. Um, what's the differential diagnosis that uh, often comes up when you're looking at this entity? Let's say if you just had maybe this area right here at high magnification. Psoriasis. Yeah. Yes, this often looks a little bit like psoriasis histologically. You've got the psoriasiform acanthotic epidermis. You've got the dilated tortuous blood vessels. You've got the thinning of the suprapapillary plates. You've got loss of the granular cell layer. Um, you can get parakeratosis. Sometimes you can even get uh, little mounds of parakeratosis with neutrophils. You get a little bit of parakeratosis over here. So it can simulate psoriasis. Um, this one's a, such a nice example that you've got the entire lesion kind of uh, encompassed in the biopsy. You, you wouldn't really have any problem diagnosing that. But we do see patients that have localized plaques of psoriasis that get sampled by shave technique. Uh, sent in as rule out basal cell carcinoma. Usually they're thinking superficial basal cell carcinoma or Bowen's disease, that sort of thing. And it just happens to be a localized plaque of psoriasis. So uh, this is in the differential diagnosis of that. And I'm not aware of this being associated with any syndrome or anything like that. So probably the most important thing here is just to recognize that this, number one, is not psoriasis and that it's a totally benign lesion with these clear staining cells in it. Nice contrast with the last lesion, which had obviously close crowding of nuclei, very atypical morphology. These cells are not atypical at all. They're very small and round and no pleomorphism, no mitoses, anything like that. Okay, all right, that's the end of the clear cell lesions. Now we have a different color cell, right? I'm not even sure what the right orientation is here. Probably like this, I guess, yeah. Um, I can go in here. Um, so it looks like there's, yeah, again, like this just large, um, large neoplasm in the dermis um, of basophilic cells. Um, I would be just given like the size and kind of it's not that symmetric and there's like some areas that are more dense and some areas that aren't. Um, I'd be kind of worried about a malignant process. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what are the color of the cells here? Um, on the, yeah, again, it's like this kind of more clear cell staining or I mean, I don't know, they're just, they're lighter, lighter purple than on the left. Yeah, this stuff is is probably some necrosis actually here, mm -hmm. but the bulk of the cells are these small blue cells. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see blue in a dense concentration in the skin, it equals bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like the blue sky that's beautiful. No, blue in, in a dermatology is not a good, good situation here. So we got a, a malignant neoplasm, very large, asymmetrical sheets of these bluish purplish staining cells here. Um, what's going on with these cells over here? Um, it looks like mitoses or, or necrosis. Yeah, these are individually necrotic cells. So these, mm -hmm. are, these are apoptotic cells. These cells are dying. It's a sign. So whenever you get necrosis on moss and a neoplasm, that's also a sign of malignancy. So what's your differential diagnosis? When you have a neoplasm like this, it's clearly malignant. There's a mitotic mm -hmm. there and one there too. Um, and you've got these poorly differentiated blue staining cells in the dermis. I would definitely, I mean, I'd be thinking about like a B cell lymphoma. Um, good, good. So a lymph, lymphoreticular neoplasm. Yeah. Why necessarily, any, why B cell? Um, Could it be a T cell? I guess it could be, but I mean, with T cells, you think like it's more, um, you don't know, like this kind of like dense and diffuse pattern of light blue cells. I think of more like B cells. Yeah. Although you can get like a tumor of mycosis fungoides. If you've ever seen that, I mean, that can be just yeah. sheets of atypical cells. Yeah. Usually they're kind of more convoluted and that sort of thing, but, um, you know, it still could theoretically be a T cell lymphoma. Yeah. I probably wouldn't 
um, declare it as B or T, just looking at this, but I would say, yeah, lymphoma could do it. It would be like an anaplastic lymphoma, very, very atypical variant of that. Um, what else do you put in the differential diagnosis? Um, I think, I mean, you can think about Merkel cells still with small blue cells. Um, good, good. So Merkel, you mean neuroendocrine, basically. Mm -hmm. So then you have to think about like a metastatic small cell carcinoma, mm -hmm. possibly carcinoid tumor, Merkel cell, that sort of thing. Um, anything else that goes in your differential? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, so I was thinking about Merkel cell. And then, yeah, another thing I was thinking about was like metastases, but I guess that kind of goes along with that like neuroendocrine thing. Um, you could think of potentially like angiosarcoma or something else that's just poorly differentiated. Yeah, I agree. I think once you, once you kind of get into this poor blue cell differential diagnosis, you can throw a number of things in there. I always put in malignant melanoma. I mean, I've been fooled by melanoma many times over the years. Um, but this uh, morphology of these cells, where you've got this sort of uh, indistinct chromatin, you don't really see really good nucleoli here. Um, it's kind of got this People call it sort of almost a salt and pepper kind of morphology. That's very characteristic of neuroendocrine carcinoma. And if you look really carefully, um, you may be able to see a little sort of dot-like structure here in some of these. Mm -hmm. That kind of correlates with the paranuclear dot staining pattern when you use cytokeratin 20 or just cytokeratin cocktail will, will highlight that as well. Uh, and, and neurofilament actually will also highlight that little area. So um, basically, this is an example of, of a Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, probably maybe even a metastatic one. It looks like it's got mostly kind of just a nodular aggregations in the derma. So this may have been somebody that had a Merkel that was primary and then metastasized to another area. Um, there's a couple of things about Merkel that are interesting. You can sometimes get intraepidermal involvement that looks like uh, with like pagetoid and epidermal change in a Merkel cells. So you can actually get the individual Merkel cells can involve the epidermis, just like uh, sebaceous carcinoma or like malignant melanoma. So sometimes that's in the differential. And then you can also get squamous differentiation in Merkel. See this area here? These look like squamous cells. So it's not uncommon to get some squamous cell carcinoma-like change in a Merkel cell. Um, I don't know exactly why that is. I'm not sure anybody has really figure that out. Uh, but it's not uncommon to see squamous cell carcinoma-like features within a Merkel cell. So the epidermal involvement, the squamous-like features, and then the little uh, indistinct chromatin pattern favors Merkel. Other things to put in the differential would include other blue cell tumors, the pediatric blue cell tumors, neuroblastoma, Wilms tumor. Um, those can kind of give you the same sort of morphology too, but um, this was an older person and that really wasn't even in the differential diagnosis here. Okay, good. Do you guys have time for one more? Or do you need to go off to clinic? Uh, we can quickly talk through this last one. Okay. Um, I think the people who are leaving are going to leave. <laughs> okay. Um, so this one, another looks like shave biopsy or, um, yeah. so, um, let's see, there's a lot of like crust up top, but I think what we're looking at is kind of more in the dermis, um, sort of like nodular collections of cells. Um, good, good. I agree. I think this is a nodular and diffuse, uh, infiltrate, you know, we just have a shave biopsy. We can look at this one. Actually, this one might even be a little bit better. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a nodular and diffuse infiltrate. And, and what kind of cells did you think these were? Um, so they're kind of, well, when I like dove down, I mean, they were like very large cells with large cytoplasm, um, but there also Good. looks like some sort of, you know, darker um, nucleus. So it may be that there's like kind of a, a large cell infiltrate with like maybe, I don't know if there might be like lymphocytes kind of coming along for the ride um, or, or if these are like two different cell populations that are infiltrating. Yeah, good. Exactly. I think that uh, if you look at the cells, they're very atypical. Uh, this one's probably got three or four nuclei there together and mitoses all over the place. Got that central area of uh, crusting and some collagen degeneration here. 
uh, necrosis of, of these cells. And then a lot of these other cells down here are really large, almost histiocytoid uh, cells down here. Epithelioid, as we talked about. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I like things that I was like potentially thinking about for different, I mean, this is clearly like a, you know, malignant process, obviously. Um, but um, like maybe like, uh, I don't know, I don't, breast carcinoma or like, um, I'm, I was trying to think about like lymphomas with like larger cells. Yeah, that's um, absolutely a possibility. And look here at the dermodermal junction. Can you see some of the cells are actually within the epidermis also? Okay, so there's some like epidermotropism. Yeah. Um, so thinking about like T cell, maybe. Uh, good, a T cell proliferative process. Now, what if I told you, again, this would probably wouldn't be fair game just to show you this and expect you to come up with the answer just out of the clear blue sky. But if we gave you some information that said this was a recurrent papular eruption in a you know, 45 year old person that had been going on for five years, um, and then you see this histology, now what would you think about? Um, I, are you think, are you kind of going towards like LYP? Yeah, lymphomatoid yeah. papulosis. And that's a pseudo malignancy. I mean, it looks very atypical. And yeah, you'd say if you just look at it at low magnification, this is obviously cancer. Well, it, it kind of really is a cancer, but it's uh, probably one that the host kind of keeps in check and they do develop this recurring uh, condition that comes and goes and 15% of them will develop an underlying lymphoma of some sort, either Hodgkin's disease, mycosis mongoides, or a CD30 positive anaplastic lymphoma. Uh, they actually can also have vasculitis in these lesions. And so we used to say that you get vasculitis associated with LYP in some cases, but we now, uh, people have segregated out these into like, I think about six different subtypes now. Um, and this would probably be the A subtype or these large anaplastic like cells. Uh, so that's a very, very, when you get this degree of atypicality and these cells almost have a histiocytoid morphology, probably these, the so-called A subtype, you don't really need to know those subtypes. Uh, they're not going to ask you that on the board examination, but they might ask you, uh, which stain would you do to confirm the diagnosis? I mean, like CD30? Yeah, CD30 stain. And that's that's positive in the vast majority of these cases. I mean, there actually are some of the subtypes that uh, are more CD8 positive and, and don't have as much CD30 staining. But uh, we generally will do CD30 when we're really trying to establish diagnosis. And it really requires good clinical correlation because if you just see this alone um, with the shave biopsy, this could be a CD30 positive anaplastic lymphoma. Um, it could be CD30 positive transformation of mycosis fungoides. So you really need to have the clinical information to make the diagnosis of this. But you're right that it, it basically looks like a lymphoma. And we actually see a lot of these get overcalled as lymphoma when they don't have clinical information, which isn't good if you have somebody that's got a relatively benign disease, can respond to low-dose methotrexate or interferon or something like that, and you put them on a high-dose CHOP or something like that. So good. Good job, everybody. And, uh, Thank you guys for participating. Hope you enjoyed this and that it was educational for you. Thank you. All right, we'll see you Thank guys you. next time. You bet.